I want to I want to circle back to something we talked about at the very beginning of the show. That's going to tie a lot of this together, I think, mm-hmm. which is that we explained uh, the word neoliberalism, right? Yeah. And the word as defined by the people who came up with it, people like uh, uh, Milton Friedman at the Chicago School of Economics, would like to define neoliberalism that way. That is, it's about free market economics. It's about the lowering of trade barriers. And it's about free trade across borders, right? That's what they'd like you to think of the word neoliberalism. Yeah. But every time that anybody has ever been able to implement it on any kind of scale uh, with any kind of freedom, for example, uh, Milton Friedman went down to Chile after uh, Augusto Pinochet affected his coup against Salvador Allende, and Milton Friedman designed the new Chilean economy. Him and a him and a class of of Chicago economists. Um, and what happened in Chile is indicative of what neoliberalism champions all over the world, which was the privatization of public wealth. Chile at the time ran a more or less successful welfare state. It was more social than the United States. This the state owned a lot of utility companies. It, you know, it owned it owned stuff uh, that was later privatized. Uh, just stick with me, Rob. That was later privatized <laughs> under Pinochet. So what happened in Chile was that you had a large middle class that immediately became a massive lower class. and You had a very small class of people that ended up in charge of what had been public wealth who ended up very wealthy, right? So we can look at the same kind of thing going on in the United States. We'll get to we'll get to Lockheed Martin in a second. But if you look at stuff like, for example, the 2008, tying in those markets we were talking about, the mm-hmm. 2008 financial crash, what happens there is the market, the private market, creates a huge amount of risk, a huge amount of debt. It privatizes all the profit from that debt, and it makes the risk public. So when the whole system goes down, who pays to bail the banks out? Well, the American taxpayer. But who made all the money? Well, not the American taxpayer. And if we look at something like the F-35, it's exactly the same thing. We have a huge amount of public money going to the development of a weapon, the profits from which are all private. Mm-hmm. And even extending that definition of the word profit, we're not, we're, we as a public, we're not even going to profit off it in the sense of having an effective war fighting vehicle. Mm-hmm. All of the profits, all of the money, all of the efficacy of the program goes to the guys who run Northrop Grumman, the lobbyists who shill for it, mm-hmm. and the newspaper men working for The Economist or magazine men uh, who reprint those press releases and benefit from the whole cycle churning uh, public money into private profit. And that's the real meaning of modern neoliberalism. I'm on board with Rob on free trade. I'm not on board with the modern practice of free trade. Uh, you know, I think you're, there are elements of what you said that I agree with, but I think you're really conflating a whole bunch of things to make a broader critique that, you know, I'm might make sense in the some modern point. neoliberalism, the modern neoliberal consensus, it encapsulates all that different stuff. But I'm 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 actually quite I'm quite of a fan of some aspects of the you know the neoliberal consensus. I would agree that you know in places like the United Kingdom and uh, the United States, we've had a little too much neoliberalism or Anglo-Saxon economics or what have you. And uh, I would absolutely uh, I agree on your critique of the too big to fail banks. I think that those are garbage. I agree with the critique of the military industrial complex. I think that's nightmarish. And I do agree that I think you're right uh, in that in the United States, in the United Kingdom, there has been, you know, perhaps privatization has gone too far, perhaps this sort of thing. But but I also think there's there's a, there's a spectrum here. Um, I think Chile is doing pretty great. Um, uh, and has been for quite some time. Uh, yeah, because they I think, I think built the freedom in their economy because they got rid of the dictator and they went back towards what they had been doing beforehand. Yes. Yeah. No. 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 I. 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 I like. I agree that the you know the Chicago boys down and down with Pinochet are lamentable. You know that's that's really shitty. But I think it's also interesting that people really gravitate towards that one example because it it makes the largest story sound terribly sinister. Whereas I do think that elements of neoliberalism, the Washington consensus writ large, what have you. And there are many other examples than just Chile where it's gone desperately awry and it's been a real problem. But um, I I do think that it's also, you know, I like economic growth. I think it has facilitated economic growth across um, the world. I mean, obviously the Chinese Communist Party is nobody's idea of neoliberal, but 
there are elements of this toolbox that they have used to bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. I think that there are liberalism with Chinese characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I do think that there are elements of the neoliberal Washington consensus toolbox that have been vital to Africa's sort of emergence from the, the sort of, um, um, you know, decades of non-growth that they had after independence. Um, So I don't think it's quite as black and white a story and quite as totalizing. Like, I think at this point, say Argentina, for example, you know, I I am not, I mean, they had, what's what's so sad is that they had, you know, their horrific dictator, um, but they didn't have the sense to hire some Chicago boys. Um, uh, And uh, if they had, I think Argentina would be in dramatically better shape. I mean, Argentina was historically a much richer country than Chile. That is no longer the case. And um, I think, you know, the legacy of the Kirchners, people who I think have advanced exactly the critique um, that you that you just laid out of neoliberalism, you know, Pinochet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, drove their country into the ground by being as anti-neoliberal as possible. Um, so it's, I think it's a spectrum, and I don't think any of these issues are quite as simple as you, as you laid out them. Well, I think I think the the issue we're having here uh, is on one side you have free market economics, which is what classic neoliberal thinkers would like to portray modern neoliberalism yeah. as. And I agree. The international free market economics. I'm on board with it, man. I'm with you. Free trade, good. Yeah. But modern neoliberalism as practiced is the thing where the United States uses the International Monetary Fund and uses the WTO to force countries to lower their trade barriers, to destroy their welfare states, uh, to lower taxes, to fit themselves into a neoliberal consensus box. As yeah, it doesn't I, always I think- country, it definitely benefits us. And especially in practice, not in theory, but in practice, mm-hmm. the privatization of public wealth. Uh, I think you're. I think you're. I think you're totalizing again. And like when I when I say neoliberal, I'm talking about a batch of philosophies, toolboxes. You know, a toolbox of approaches to things. Um, and I guess I, you know, as someone who would would call himself a neoliberal and and an advocate for for those sorts of policies, I would of course try to make this box much smaller. I, what, what I get the sense is that you're saying, and I think it is fair to say that neoliberalism writ large has been the guiding ideology of the past 40 years or so. What I, as someone who would you know, generally see himself as, as a neoliberal, would say that many of the examples you point to are failures, um, you know, instances where um, uh, sort of good neoliberal ideas were corrupted by crony capitalists or it was implemented incorrectly, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Like, I think a great A great example would be like, okay, so the same set of ideas, the same toolbox was implemented in both Poland and Russia, Um, you know, the same philosophies. I think actually, you know, I'm sure Friedman Knights or sort of, uh, you know, Chicago school disciples played a part in both transitions to capitalist. Uh, And they they both both feature in Naomi Klein's book too. What's that? They both feature in Naomi Klein's book, too. Yeah, Um, like Russia's experience has been really, you know, I'm not even 100 percent sure that Russia's experience has been uniformly disastrous. But I don't think that anybody would dispute that it's ended up in a place that nobody likes and was poorly done from the very beginning. And it's, it's just, you know, a shit show. And it's Poland. exactly what I'm talking about. What's that? A huge, it's exactly what I'm talking about. You had the entire state apparatus under the USSR sold off. Uh, to what's now become a ruling class of oligarchs, the privatization of public wealth. Let me finish. Let me finish. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what happened in Russia, and it sucks. Um, but Poland, the Czech Republic, um, Hungary to a degree, implemented a range of um, other, um, and they, they, I think, yeah, I believe shock doctrine is a derivative of shock therapy, which was the... Yep. Um, the, the policy that was intentionally implemented. And uh, while we can certainly all have our quibbles with the current Polish and Hungarian governments, it fucking worked. Like it worked well. Um, you know, Poland is now getting to the point where it's richer than Spain, um, which is extraordinary when you consider where they were in 1989. 
So we're talking about differing implementations of a sort of an ideology. I think what you're trying to construct a broader critique of is the world as it is, is neoliberal. And I would, I would dispute that. Um, I would dispute that, I think, quite vigorously. Um, I think that the neoliberalism that I support, the sort of Washington consensus reforms that I've, I've been pleased with, um, um, are just aspects of what has happened in any given country. Um, and I know that Naomi Klein and others have, have uh, certainly sold a lot of books by um, tying everything to the decisions of uh, certain, um, certain entities, institutions, and philosophies, but I, I don't think that's fair. Well, I think, I think again, we're, we're running up against a problem that's not really a disagreement of ours, uh, but, a, but a problem of definitions and semantics. You call sure. yourself a neoliberal, but I think what you really are is like a classical liberal. No? Well, that's, yeah, sure. Well, that's the thing. Neoliberalism, at least at least in my sphere, has come to mean this other body. Yes. Uh, not just classical liberal economics, but the imposition of a, a sort of a different philosophy, one that's one that's more in line with stuff. That I'm well, in. But, but uh, yes, I, no, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think it's yeah. very true. But I could actually point to um, successful IMF programs. There's 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 a lot of them actually. Um, uh, places where you know all the money was paid off um, and worked out. Um, actually, the United Kingdom is actually an example of that. Um, uh, Turkey completed its IMF packages, and I, I you know I'm not going to Google it right now, but I would assume there are dozens and dozens more. Are there places where you know the IMF? Uh, participation was just another, you know, disaster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think that those examples, like Pinochet and the Chicago Boys, uh, get highlighted um, not unfairly because these are these are cautionary tales we should all be aware of. Um, but um, uh, they get highlighted disproportionately. Um, I would argue. And well, I, I think I love, I love somebody WTO, but but I, you might have a rejoinder before. Yeah. Well, somebody somebody uh, mentioned mentioned something along these lines in the chat that I that I think is uh, indicative of what my real feeling towards towards what, what I understand to be the neoliberal neoliberal or Washington consensus, which is that the the point of all this, and I, and I think its domination of the philosophy of the big international monetary institutions is more of a, a symptom of the last maybe 15, 20 years. But um, the point is to crack open protected economies and expose them, uh, expose their profit making potential to international capital, right? So what we, the reason Chile upsets us isn't that, that socialism in a vacuum upsets us, we wanna crack that open to let our money invest there and make, make profit off of it. Mm -hmm. And what I would argue, uh, and what this is what somebody in the chat said, that the successes of neoliberalism mm -hmm. uh, are byproducts they're not the goal. They're just something that sometimes happens. People are always going to make money, and sometimes the country in question uh, works out. And I think Turkey is not maybe an excellent example of a success uh, because, you know, ideally the neoliberal con or the neoliberal approach should create an economy that works and that mm -hmm. supports a politics that accords with classical liberalism, right? Mm -hmm. But we've got the opposite of that in Turkey, we've got an economy that works and a mm -hmm. politics that's anathema to classical liberalism. Okay, uh, on one point, uh, speaking as somebody who uh, is in Turkey, yes, the political ramifications uh, have been not ideal, and you can check out plenty of videos on my channel to talk about that. But in terms of the building of wealth, the building of institutions, the building of I, I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't help but be impressed. You know, that's the reason this, this guy Erdogan keeps getting reelected is uh, a lot of people have experienced a pretty extraordinary rise in their living standards. Uh, but uh, what, what I do wanna, and you know, you made an excellent point, I think about five minutes back that like, um, you know, the, the, the neoliberal, uh, you made other good points, but no, the one that I'm specifically gonna talk, talk to is that, that neoliberal, the word is something you can you can find uh, you can spend hours going through fights over what neoliberal means on Twitter threads like you can like, you know, people who like oh, I'm a big neoliberal and you're full of shit. That's not what I believe or like that. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. It's semantics and it's something that we can do 
for years. Um, so unfortunately, I'm going to I'm going to sort of violate this. So say a classical liberal or a neoliberal person to, to address your other point um, would say that, um, of course, the, the benefits uh, that accrue to countries um, are just a side product of greed and and filthy lucre. I mean, that's that's as classical liberal as you can get. I mean, I don't. You know, Adam Smith may be a roundly abused uh, thinker, but I, I don't think it's mischaracterizing him to say that, yeah, that was his point, that, that there would be um, positive, that was one of, one of his many uh, very good points, that there would be positive ramifications uh, from the exercise of greed and, and, and what have you. Um, but I do want to say, like, I'm not uh, completely against this idea that, yes, I and mean, I think... That's why I think that you know, Chile and the Chicago Boys is a cautionary tale, and it is something that happened that was wrong, um, and that exists. That is the case, despite the fact that uh, the, the 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 it may have ended up placing Chile in a, in a better place. Now, I, I agree completely that, that these things have happened. I think that the do you have a rejoinder to that, or can I talk about the WTO for a second? Well, I think I think there's one point to add. There is. Um... I think if people go back and read Adam Smith, he's nowhere near as conservative in today's oh, terms as people tend to think that he is. No question. Um, no question. Yeah, no. Uh, but I think we've gotten to the point where we can recognize that a free market economy does not correspond as well uh, to liberal democracy as we once thought that it did. Uh, you know, communism with Chinese characteristics has not produced democracy with Chinese characteristics in China. Dude, man, I've done, I've done, I've done very angry videos on exactly this topic. Yeah. Um, anyway. So the other thing there is, yeah, look, we we can say the WTO and the IMF and and every other international monetary and trade institution are set up along invisible hand lines where the use of human greed creates wealth, mm -hmm. uh, and other positive aspects are really side effects of that that uh, dynamic. But in an age when we recognize that economics don't correspond one to one to politics and we're looking at a world order that we used to be shepherding or at least used to pretend to be shepherding towards liberal democracy the world over, mm -hmm. we got to look at the side effects versus the, the intended effect of the institutions that we run. And I, what I mean to say there is what I mean to say there is, is you take a case like Chile mm -hmm. and after the Chicago boys went down, the Chilean economy for like three or four years, it grew like gangbusters. Mm -hmm. uh, but it grew the way the U.S. economy is growing right now, where the stock market goes up, the full, mm -hmm. the, the total of wealth goes up, GDP increases, but the distribution of that wealth uh, becomes massively unequal and results in a society that is less democratic uh, and less well off uh, in the aggregate than it was before. Um, mm -hmm. And we got to a point where that's you, that's got to be a consideration too. It can't just be the creation of wealth for wealth's sake. You got to look at the politics that result from the politics. But, but I mean, but Chile, I mean, you're talking about, you know, three or four years after the Chicago boys did their work. And I mean, like that, that, that's like, that strikes me as akin to the, you know, Donald Trump has been president for eight hours. So everything that's good about the economy is now his responsibility and everything that's bad is Obama's. You well, know, I like, mean, if, it strikes if, me as just, 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 I, just with, to make sure that I'm not making, I'm not giving the impression that I'm giving an unfair characterization of what went on in Chile. Chile's economy grows in those four or five years because they sell off the assets of the state. And no, that looks on the books like both. What happens is that the economy crashes, the majority of people end up in poverty, and Chile has since then climbed its way back up to the classically liberal welfare state that it was before the Chicago boys went down. But my but my my um my take on the Chilean economy um, is that you can't look at the Chicago Boys legacy or really anything in economics and say that, you know, uh, what happens four or five years later is what's important or exclusively what's important. I mean, it's what has happened in, you know, the, I guess we're, geez, we're closing in on 40 years since, uh, well, we're over 40 years since now. Um, and I do believe that the success, I think um, you might argue that it's unfairly, I'm sure that Naomi Klein would say unfairly, that a lot of the success of the Chilean economy uh, has been attributed to reforms that occurred under Pinochet. And it has maintained, as you pointed out, an incredibly um, sort of uh, democratic and the more socialist um, 
vein uh, uh, sort of political scene. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, once democracy was restored, um, the welfare state was put back together, but it was a welfare state that was able to operate at a higher level because it had more resources, um, because the pie was much larger because of uh, reforms that the Chicago boys had put into place. Yeah, I, I don't think that argument holds up to scrutiny. I mean, you can't you can't work a counterfactual, but if you keep the Chilean economy in '73 in place and let it grow over the same period, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's hard to argue that you'd end up with something worse than what ended up at the end. And uh, you do it without torturing, at, you know, dozens of thousands of people. Look at look at Argentina. But but see, once again, you're not asking me to defend the Chicago Boys' policies. You're asking me to defend Pinochet, which is why this example is something that we hear about so much. I'm not going to defend Pinochet. I'm not going to say that it's a good thing, that um, it would be great if um, you know, both Argentina and Chile had had the experience that Costa Rica had over the past 70 years. Uh, because I'm not, they, I'm because they didn't, huh? I'm, I'm saying that if you keep the state in place that existed beforehand, which yes. was doing just fine from the perspective of the average Chilean, and you mm -hmm. let that grow over the same period, I think it's hard no, no, to argue that it would be worse than what I'm, I'm agreeing happen. with you. I'm saying, so Costa Rica did away with its military in the 50s. Um, so it got to avoid the, in, the the sort of strong man, you know, there were no hooks for the CIA to, to, to dive in on, you know, like you know, they, 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 got, they got to avoid this whole nightmare. Argentina didn't, Chile did not. These are countries that were similar, except I believe as recently as the 1970s, Argentina was much richer than Chile. Obviously, I think it would be better if Pinochet had never happened to Chile. Obviously, I think it would have been better if Varela and all his monsters didn't um, uh, have control of Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, the Chicago boys, Pinochet's choice to employ a bunch of neoliberal economists from the University of Chicago, um, had a very real impact on, the, on Chile. Chile is richer and, you know, macroeconomically infinitely healthier than Argentina is today. Obviously, I'm not going to defend Pinochet say that that was a good thing. Um, but I think that I think that's actually that's sort of a counterexample. It's not like this sort of shock doctrine automatically, you know, we put in a dictator and we throw these neoliberal guys at it. That didn't fucking happen in Argentina. Argentina had a similarly horrific uh, situation with right wing dictators and um, you know, did manage to democratize and thank God for that. And it's fantastic. But it's been, you know, essentially 40 years of shit for them um, since then. Uh, Chile had a different experience. Um, so I do think it's a little unfair to say that defending the Chicago boys and what they managed to do for the Chilean economy is defending Pinochet. I would never do that. I, I think, like I said, it'd be great if they'd all had um, Costa Rica's experience, but, but they did not. Yeah, um, I think we got to move on because we're never going to agree on that per, on that phrase. For you, it's what the Chicago Boys did for the Chilean economy. For me, it's what they did to the Chilean economy. And all success since has been reversing the re the reforms made by the Chicago Boys. That, that's I don't think that I don't think, hey, I don't hey, think we're, we're, we're not going to reach agreement right no. here. Uh, and I think we move on to the IMF, which now Sal Sal Gutierrez is is saying somebody loves the IMF. 